I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about endometriosis and the functional approach. Many times when we have endometriosis, the first line of defense is surgery. Although we will be talking about surgery in this podcast, we're talking about the right type of surgery to, to get. And then also we're talking about how we can look at this functionally and really address the healing opportunities that conventional medicine typically misses. Excited for you to listen to this episode. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have four spots available per month to work with us. I would like to invite you and your partner to a supercharge your fertility discovery call. And this calls for you if you meet at least one of these criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This calls for action takers. If you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. If you're seriously considering working with us, Go to Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. That's Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. There's a lot of information about which supplements are right for fertility. And like most couples I speak with, you are probably taking a lot of supplements. But are these supplements optimizing or harming your fertility? That's why we recommend professional-grade supplements without harmful dyes, fillers, or top allergens so that you can prepare your body in the best way for pregnancy. And as you may know, we take a functional approach to fertility, and while supplements are included in your customized protocols, which are based on testing, they are only part of the equation because there's no pill you can take that without supplement the basics, such as poor diet, dysregulated sleep, either moving too much or not enough, and not dealing with chronic stress. So we do recommend basic supplements for both men and women. And these are essential starters that you need to have right now to optimize your preconception health. And I'm excited to offer you a special discount at our Fab Fertile store. You'll receive 15% discount on our professional grade supplements. So simply go to Fab Fertile store. That's F-A-B Fertile store.com to access the basic supplements so that you can prepare your body for pregnancy success without wasting time and money on supplements that may not be right for you. Go to Fab Fertile Store, that's fabfertilestore.com, and save 15% on your order. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you, if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take the few minutes right now, you can pause this, this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under, Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey there, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. 
I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Dr. Amy Day to the podcast, and we're digging into how to get pregnant naturally with endometriosis. Dr. Amy Day has been at the forefront of the natural women's health movement since 2004 after receiving the fourth ND license in the state of California. While in naturopathic medical school, struggles with her own women's health issues fueled Dr. Amy's passion. She is now a hormone expert and author, a speaker for both medical and professionals in the public, and believes that every woman has the right to be vital. As the founder and CEO of the Women's Vitality Center, she helps busy professional women with stress, fatigue, hormonal issues to feel fantastic again. Check out her website at womensvitalitycenter.com. And thanks so much for listening. I'm so thankful that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who's on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Dr. Amy, excited to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Yeah. So if you could share your journey of really how you came to do this work, a lot of us typically have our own kind of dark night of the soul and figuring out things on our, you know, to heal ourselves and then end up helping others. So what's what is if you can share your journey with us? Yeah, so I can tell you a bit here and then it may unfold as we as we share more about our topic for today, too. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I I uh, became interested in natural medicine in a very broad way. I just liked doing things differently than than how my parents were, or the, than you know how I was how I was raised and bringing up and everything. So I just really liked the alternative concepts and looking more holistically at the body and how we work. And then when I was in naturopathic medical school, I was diagnosed with endometriosis. And in the process of learning about that and going through and figuring out my own um, treatment and care and what that meant, it really focused me in on women's health in particular and um, pelvic health and hormones and um, just the experience that so many women have, which I was going through at that time of the frustration of not being able to get good explanations about why things were happening and not being given, um, you know, choices really in how to approach taking care of myself. So I, I learned from the patient side of things and, um, that, that really has, has fueled me in what I, uh, now aim to offer for our patients. So excellent. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So, yeah, so we, we do, so we help a lot of clients that are either it's either low AMH or high FSH and premature ovarian insufficiency and failure and diminished ovarian reserve. And also people with endo who typically would then have low AMH is what we're seeing kind of correlating with it. I just want to talk about the conventional approach versus the functional slash integrative approach with endometriosis and, and what, what you're seeing um, out there is maybe we can start with the conventional side of things and what they typically will recommend for someone who is diagnosed with endo. There are a lot of options, I think is one of the things that I, I think is so important and good for, for women and listeners to know is that there are actually a lot of options. And um, in conventional medicine, there you know there's a range of options. And then in the world of functional, integrative, naturopathic, holistic care, there's so many additional or, or different things that you can do as well. So in the conventional approach, it, I mean, it really breaks down into the two main categories, right? Drugs and surgery mm-hmm. and, uh, or, or the do, or the wait and see, right? The do nothing and just kind of wait and see, which is not what most women <laughs> I know want to do. In the realm of drugs or medications, there are a few options on the market right now. Unfortunately, none of them are really ideal options. Um, they they could they do potentially have high efficacy for some women, um, but they also come with a slew of side effects for for many women. So it's not a slam dunk easy answer. Um, there's certainly a time and a place, uh, but it's it's something that women really need additional options compared to what is out there right now. Um, and there is more research being done, but it's it's just a slow process. So. Um, and then on the side of surgery, a lot of women uh, do get recommended to have surgery, and especially with fertility as a as a um, goal, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of women are told to have surgery as a way to kind of clean the slate and and create an environment for uh, more optimal fertility. However, it's not that straightforward. So it's I think most surgeons really present it as like here we'll like we'll take the endo out, you know, we'll like completely mm-hmm. remove it and just take you know, like take care of that piece and then and then you're back to baseline and you'll you know you'll have your fertility. 
Um, but endometriosis actually is a much more complex process that's going on in the body. This, and one of the ways that it shows up is these lesions that grow in the pelvis, but there are many other deeper aspects going on that also need to be addressed. So it's, it can be part of the picture, the drugs, the surgery, um, but, but neither one tends to take care of the whole picture, really. I just want to ask you about um, as many times people are recommended birth control um, or the uh, Mirena IUD to help reduce um, the growth of the tissue. What's we've we've done many many podcast episodes on post birth control pill syndrome. We had Dr. Um, Jolene Brighton on the podcast talking about her book uh, Beyond the Pill. And really, you can have these um, side effects from birth control. And yeah, so definitely. So, so both the IUD and birth control are certainly not preferred when one is trying to get pregnant. That's right. So that's you know, unfortunately, the the approach of addressing endo as a hormonal disease means disrupting the hormones, which is usually done either with a birth control pill, an IUD, or a, a, a GnRH agonist or antagonist, something like Lupron or or uh, or Alyssa. Um, so which puts women into menopause. So being in menopause or being on the pill or having the IUD, none of those are conducive to getting pregnant. So um, that's definitely a challenge. Sometimes these are done temporarily to help, you know, calm things down. But like you were just saying, there are after there are side effects during and then there are after effects of trying to get the body and the hormones back into balance and the body working better again after that too. So there's again, there's a time and a place. I, I think it's so important that women do have many different options and there's no option that's completely off the table. Um, but it's important to be educated and understand uh, the pros and cons of different things. And then as far as the functional approach or integrative approach, what's your take on that for endometriosis? Yeah. So here is, so I, I uh, teach and approach with our, our patients and, and clients this way. There are five keys and I like to, uh, I have an acronym that just helps to, to keep it straight in your mind as a list. So think about the fact that endometriosis hides so H-I-D-E-S hmm. and HIDES stands for H is for hormones. So it is it is important to address the hormones and, and um, rebalance those. Uh, I is for immune system, which can be both a matter of like inflammation um, is so prevalent with endometriosis or infections or other, other challenges that the um, immune system may be facing. So that was hormones, immune system. The D is for digestive health. Mm -hmm. So really big connection between the GI um, and endometriosis for, for many different reasons. And any discomfort in the GI really can flare up endo discomfort too. It's all located in the same place in our body. Um, and there's a lot of cross connection and functionality of how the digestive system impacts your hormones and impacts your immune system and, um, and all of that. So that, that's important too. E is for environment. Um, so environmental influences, uh, detoxification, kind of looking at what, what kind of um, toxic influences we may be exposed to. And this is Part of um, what I think explains why endo and many other women's health conditions are on the rise, mm -hmm. um, the xenoestrogens and different kind of chemicals in our products or in our environment that we're exposed to that um, act like hormones. And then the final uh, piece, so hormones, immune, digestion, environment, and then the last piece is stress. Mm -hmm. So very huge impact of stress. And I, I, I think at least, yeah, I'm trying to remember if there's even been one. I'll, I'll, I'll hedge my, my numbers and say 99% of the women that I talk to about endo, it's very clear that stress is a big component um, of when their pain is worse and when their flares are worse and um, when things are more difficult for them, when their stress is up and when they're in a place in their lives where they're managing their stress better, um, that, that things can, can settle. So that's an important component as well. Okay. Yeah. That's a helpful acronym. So HIDES, as you say, hormones, immune, digestive environment and stress. So let's, um, let's just kind of circle back to the, the surgery piece of this because it is, can be a standard recommendation 
when they're seeing lesions or yeah, they're seeing lesions and then they're, so they're re- recommending surgery as a standard recommendation. So what's your take on, on that? I think you had some personal experience with that as well. Yeah. So I think it's really important to, um, to understand that endometriosis is not lesions that grow in the pelvis. It, that is one manifestation of endometriosis. Endo is actually a neuroendocrine immune imbalance in the body. And one of the ways that that shows up is that tissue that is similar to the lining of the, the uterus called the endometrium can grow outside of the uterus, right? It can grow in the, in the, in the pelvic cavity, um, usually is where that would be. But the, the important question to ask is why is that happening? Mm-hmm. Like why, what is it that allows those cells to grow in those places where it's not supposed to? So looking at the, the difference of the immune system and the endocrine system and, and how the body is functioning that allows those tissues to grow there is super critical and important to address. If all you do is go in and cut the lesions out, um, there's a, there's a pretty good chance that they would grow back if you're not also addressing the other factors that are going on in the body. Um, and just one little explanation. I did just say, if you cut the, t- the lesions out, there are different techniques used in surgery and the excision is when they actually do cut the the whole lesion out, that is the recommended highest efficacy for an endo surgery, um, as opposed to burning the surface, like sometimes it's laser or ablation Mm -hmm. is what's done during surgery where they they, uh, use a laser and burn the, the where they see the lesion, but it doesn't necessarily go full depth and you can't be sure that you got it all. Um, so if someone is pursuing surgery, it's important to um, talk to your surgeon about the technique that they use and make sure that um, they're on board with the importance of excision in order to get the whole lesion out that is there. So, and yeah, my, my personal experience. So when I was in uh, naturopathic medical school, I, I had been on the birth control pill prior to that. And then as I'm learning all about natural medicine, I realized I really didn't want to be on synthetic hormones. And I was noticing all these side effects that I had just been putting up with for a long time. And I went off of it. Um, and I found, you know, within the span of a year that I was having horrifically painful periods, um, making it really difficult to function. And the, you know, classic curled up on the bathroom floor, crying, vomiting, heart to function. Um, if there are women listening who have endo, you know what I mean? And my mom had had endometriosis. So it was, you know, it didn't take me as long to get to diagnosis as it does for some women um, who go to their doctor with these kind of symptoms and they're told, oh yeah, it's normal. Your period's supposed to hurt. Um, so I, I did, was able to, you know, understand fairly quickly what was going on. And I had an emergency surgery because of how severe it got, how quickly. Um, and that was not done by an endo specialist. And, but it did get definitely help and, and surgery can absolutely be part of the picture when things have, you know, grown so much. I had multiple large cysts growing on my ovaries and, um, just a a really, um, a lot of disease growing in my pelvis. So it really needed to have the surgery I felt, um, to cut that out. But then, I like dove in to, I was in naturopathic school. I had access to, you know, all the herbs and the acupuncture and learning about nutrition mm-hmm. and learning about hormone balance and all these different ways of helping my body. Um, so I, I was able to, even though I had stage four endo, a lot of women with stage four endo end up back in surgery repeatedly, you know, every year or two. Um, and fortunately that, that has not been what had to happen for me. Yeah. Cause I've read studies that can say that even if you do have the surgery, the endo, and you're mentioning this, endo can re- reappear in 45% of the cases. I'm not sure if, if that's just um, a stat that you're you're seeing, or maybe you're seeing it higher. Yeah, it depends on the on the staging and and a lot of other factors too. But that sounds about right. Even more, it's you know even more likely in the more aggressive, uh, deeper types of endo growth. And just for, for someone, if you have any recommendations for resources to um, where to find a surgeon that would do excision, if that's the route that they, they need to go, do you have a, a resource you can 
talk about? You know, there's there. So if someone's really looking into surgery, there's actually there's a Facebook group called Nancy's Nook. Oh, right. Yeah. That, have you heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. So Nancy is a, a nurse who used to work with um, one of the excision surgeon surgeons. They it's it is a great resource for connecting if if you know you're looking for information about surgery. Um, the, the, you know, there's, it's a, a big focus on surgery is the answer. So I feel like taking a, a holistic approach that looks at other things also is really important But for the surgery piece of it. There's a lot of great resources and, um, pe- people share a lot about their experiences with different doctors, different, you know, places around the country and around the world. So, okay. So Nancy's nook. Okay. So let's dig into the functional side of things and how do we actually address the, the endo and starting with diet. So we typically will have people do an elimination diet, taking out the top allergens and then systematically reintroducing them to see how food impacts the diet and then doing food sensitivity testing. And then, then potentially if warranted, um, an autoimmune protocol diet, because there may, there may be an autoimmune component with endo. What's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's, I agree with, you know, conceptually with all of that. I, I, the one piece that I would add is that oftentimes when people have a lot of, uh, of history of inflammation and GI dysfunction Mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed because they may be sensitive to all sorts of foods, but it's not necessarily because they have to take all of those foods out and like live and eat this like really restrictive diet. So I'm very aware of the role of stress for people too, Mm -hmm. and trying to not like overly stress out that restrictiveness of having to take so many things out of their diet, but looking at, you know, so simultaneously looking at digestive health and how to help the, the, um, body to be more resilient and able to tolerate and, and eat a variety of foods. Um, I think a big inf- emphasis on all, on the um, anti-inflammatory kinds of foods and really rich antioxidants. Um, so of course your fruits and vegetables, you know, especially on the vegetable side, keeping sugars down and uh, getting a variety of colorful, you know, dark, bright colors in your dark leafy greens every day and then bright orange things and red things and purple things and like trying to get all those colors the um, antioxidants really have a big influence on the immune system and the the specific um, factors that are going on in the immune system in women with endo that allow that tissue to grow um, so it's a little hard to think of it this way but physiologically there's actually a lot of similarity between how the endo cells grow and how cancer cells grow mm-hmm. so to be clear endometriosis is not cancer um, but looking at what allows cells to grow and how those cells are evading the immune clearance that usually takes out abnormal cells um, can be very similar so a lot of this similar kinds of dietary approaches and and other approaches that a woman might um, do to prevent breast cancer, for example, would be very similar. So big emphasis on cruciferous vegetables because they also help to clear uh, estrogens out of the body um, and support the detoxification system. So that's the, you know, broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and um, that family of vegetables, lots of those is uh, really good to include too. So, and then with the blood sugar piece, we 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 see this a lot with people we're working with. So, um, I guess high, high insulin levels. So, what's mm. what are what are you seeing? Yeah, totally. And actually, one one other thing I wanted to say on the diet piece of all mm-hmm. of the different things that someone may take out to do a, um, a elimination diet and look at those common triggers and everything, gluten I do believe is one of the most important things for women with endo to uh, to get out of their their diet at least as an experiment for a month or two, preferably to see what difference it makes. But even if you don't really notice a difference, chances are that would be um, wreaking havoc. And there's, there are some good studies. There's, there was a study, I think it was done in France, if I'm remembering off the top of my head right now, um, where, where women, um, I think it was about an 80% benefit from having gluten out of the diet. So really, really worth trying that one. Even if you're overwhelmed by the idea of like having to take a whole bunch of things out of your diet, that one's worth doing. So yeah, we're, yeah, we're seeing that with when we're doing, um, the elimination diet and we're looking at it typically a 
food sensitivity test, like a Zoomer, and um, that's sort of digging into the minutia of foods. It's like a 100-page report. And yeah. and for gluten, it'll go into all the different proteins. And we see regularly, like anecdotally, with people with, with women with endo that have uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So it, like their, their gluten is completely off the chart. So extremely yeah. sensitive. So that's what we're yeah. seeing. Even though they're not celiac, but it's still right. having, it's still wreaking havoc. So that's yeah. Right. Yeah. So the insulin and blood sugar thing, absolutely. It's, you know, insulin is an inflammatory molecule. Sugar causes inflammation in our body too. So and when you have endometriosis, you want to be doing everything anti-inflammatory. Mm. Um, really want to be, be calming the immune system, um, calming the stress system too. So big connection between stress and blood sugar regulation. Um, when you're skipping meals or eating, you know, more like carbohydrate based meals and going on the blood sugar roller coaster of ups and downs, um, it's, it really, uh, destabilizes the body and, and makes a big difference. So really getting that stability of getting your protein in and getting the high fiber foods and eating your good quality fats, you get the anti-inflammatory benefit from good fats, plus it stabilizes blood sugar. So yes, stabilizing blood sugar, very important. What's your take on vegan or vegetarian diets? So I think that um, as long as you can get the amount of protein and the quality fats that you need, that it can be done either in a plant-based diet or an animal-based diet. Mm -hmm. I have seen, um, you know, there are studies and whatnot on, on getting uh, animal protein out for the sake of like autoimmune diseases or that sort of thing. Um, but I really have never seen a study that differentiated the quality of the source yeah. of the meat. So I think if you are going to be eating animal protein, that you really do want to pay attention to the source and the quality. And I've definitely seen women who were having a really hard time getting the, the nutrients that their, their body needed in a strictly plant-based diet and adding some high quality animal sourced proteins really round things out for them and help them feel a lot better. So I think it can be done either way. And it's a matter of really listening to your body and, and trying, you know, something for a while and see how that goes. Yeah. We've seen the same and yeah, getting that wild caught grass fed um, meat that as you say, high quality is, is key. Exactly. Um, and in your acronym in the, in the beginning hives, you talked about number four, the environment. So Let's talk, and we've done a number of um, episodes on this podcast talking about environmental toxins. So let's talk about why that's so important for um, someone with endometriosis to really look at the the environmental impact. Yeah, so many, many uh, chemicals in our environment are endocrine disruptors, um, and particularly xenoestrogens. It starts with an X, but pronounced mm. xenoestrogens which mimic the action of estrogen, but actually to a much higher degree, you know, like a thousand times stronger binding to estrogen receptors. So it can have a really, really strong hormonal influence in our bodies. And this is, you know, particularly we I think a lot of people on your podcast probably heard this before than things like that what's in plastics or what, especially the soft plastics, right? Or the BP, um, the, the BPA and the phthalates that are used in different products and fragrances and all that. So having, have be, having an awareness about the things that you use in and around your body and your home is really important. Uh, when we have that, that strong estrogen influence from these chemicals, it makes it a lot harder on the body to establish the balance. Um, and in one hormone, one um, toxin in particular, dioxin, has had specific research done on it in the world of endometriosis. And they actually now know it's so dependable that dioxin will cause endometriosis that when, when they do animal studies on, on different aspects of endometriosis, they'll use dioxin to create endometriosis in the, the animals and then have other control animals that they compare that to. So it's, it's a very direct, definite impact. And uh, dioxin, where can that be found? You know, dioxin is, uh, it's not as specific of like, you know, a certain product or a certain food or a certain thing to look on the label, unfortunately. It's, it's kind of pervasive in our environment because it's a, it's a byproduct of industry. Mm -hmm. So it's in air and it can get in soil. And it's a, it's, 
it's a harder thing to avoid as an individual, but a really important thing to work on as a society. Mm -hmm. So yeah, looking at, so having air filters and uh, getting your veggies and your produce from organic means as much as possible, the dirty dozen at least, or yes. to me, to me, to me, hundred percent organic. I know people think it's maybe cost prohibitive, but then also dealing with illness, um, that, that has its cost as well. So absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and there's, I think there's the, again, I'm always aware of stress for people. So the idea of being like, a hundred percent perfect or never getting exposed to anything. Like you can, you can create a lot of, of stress for yourself trying to be, you know, like living in a bubble. And I, I think that, um, that balance of trying to protect yourself from exposure as much as you can, but also trying to build your resiliency in your body. So you want your, your digestive system working well. So you're pooping, you know, pooping stuff out. You want to be drink, getting lots of fluids in. So you're urinating. You want to be exercising and or doing saunas or something where you're sweating regularly so that you're constantly detoxing and clearing things out of your body. We're, we're designed to be able to handle you know, some amount of, of the influence of these things and then be able to clear it out. Um, so it's both reducing the exposure and supporting your body in elimination. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And yeah, and so you can go to Skin Deep Database and look at your personal care products. And it's not about, you want a rating below three, but it's not about throwing them all in the garbage. It's as each one expires, then choose a non-toxic option. Because I've had people that kind of like, oh my goodness, panic and want to take the whole house and throw it in the garbage. And as you say, that in itself can be a stressful. Right. Unless it just feels freeing and wonderful yeah. and you yeah. want to do it, then go for it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you can be, you can realize like, well, the house needs to go in the garbage too, because like <laughs> the paint or the yeah. wall material or whatever, you're like, oh my God, where can I even go live? And yeah. so yes, finding that balance of like, do, do as much as you can keep working on it, you know, keep shifting in that direction, you know, getting your routines in place of the kinds of products you buy. And the next time you're, you know, putting, you know, deciding on your floor coverings or your paint or whatever, like make these choices so that you're moving in that direction and, um, and trying to, in the meanwhile, make sure you're po pooping and peeing and sweating so mm -hmm. that you're helping your body get things out too. Mm -hmm. And so our next one is uh, sleep. We've done many episodes on, on sleep and the impact with fertility. Um, so let's talk about how that specifically will impact uh, endo and what, what and what you're seeing. Yeah, that's interesting. I, it's not something that I have ever seen research on directly, but I can tell you that it just you know it just makes sense, and we're going to see it in our patients too. And that's that idea of that when you're sleeping is when your body heals. So it's, that's when your detox is all happening. That's when your, your tissue repair is happening. That's when your body's processing everything and your immune system is most active and managing the inflammation. Um, so it's, your body is actively working on all the things you really want it to be doing for you. So the more time you give it to do that, the better. <laughs> so um, giving, giving yourself that sleep. And I, I really find for women with endo or for other kinds of chronic uh, conditions that it's, it's important that you um, kind of, kind of wrap your head around the mindset of it being okay to sleep more. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in our society, we have a very, uh, for many people do at least like a very driven, be productive all hours of the day kind of um, you know, badge of honor kind of thing. Like I get by on four hours of sleep and that's awesome. Or something like that. It's, it's really detrimental to function like that for very long. And I think that it's important to know that it's actually really important, productive work that is being done while you're sleeping and while you're resting, even if it's daytime, you know, wake, wakeful, but in a restful state. Um, you're, you're, it's so important to do that. And it's not lazy. I'll, I'll tell people, I will literally write you a prescription for nine hours of sleep. Yeah. If you need that to make you feel like this is a necessary thing. Um, it's not lazy. You need it. Yeah. That fear of missing out FOMO, kind of like, Oh, oh I got to be up all night and helping people yet yeah, to prioritize sleep. And a lot of times people are, are having, hard times falling asleep or waking up in the middle of the night, or then they're feeling exhausted. I see a lot of people with, let's see if you're seeing this with like the fatigue. And I think that's one of your, um, we'll be talking about this later in the podcast, but what are you seeing around just exhaustion and people that have endo? Yeah, I, I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> short answer. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, both in the, in the idea that, that running yourself into exhaustion can certainly worsen and exacerbate the, the endo symptoms and issues and the other way around, right? When you're dealing with chronic pain, mm. that's exhausting. It really yeah. takes energy to just cope, you know, to just, go through the the motions every day when you're not feeling well. So it's, it's yes, a huge, huge connection. I see it a lot. Um, and what I also see that's beautiful is that when women are able to get that extra rest and give their bodies that chance to do a little healing and build a little resiliency, that it makes a really big difference. And when you get a little bit more rest and then you're a little less exhausted, you have a little more energy in the daytime, maybe that's going to help you to feel like you can take the time to look at skin deep and, and yeah. look at your products. Or that's when you're going to be like, oh, I, I can like, you know, check out a new recipe or two and get some more veggies, or I can finally get around to doing those green smoothies or whatever. So it just, you know, any, any little bit that helps you to feel a little more rested, makes you a little more capable of, and you know, the next step of anything else that you're needing or wanting to be doing for yourself. Yeah. I guess many times we can be stuck in overwhelm or, or burnout and, and that's, yeah, that's a, it's just shut down at that point. Mm -hmm. It's a downward spiral where you're just like, no, 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 mm -hmm. you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. So if you can just open the door, take a little step, then you can build an upward spiral where things build momentum and get a little easier. But sleep is one of the most important aspects of that. So, and my, my favorite tip on this is to go to bed early. So sometimes when we think about getting more sleep, we think about sleeping in in the morning, but when we want to have better energy during the daytime, the adrenal glands actually need to have the signal of your body getting up and, and moving around at about the same time every morning in order to know the adrenal glands produce cortisol that give you your get up and go. And if you're asking your adrenal glands to do that for you, some days at 6 a.m., some days at 10 a.m., some days at 7.30, it's like your, your hormonal system isn't really quite sure what to do to help you. Um, whereas if you can be consistent with waking up at about the same time every morning, that teaches the adrenals to produce the cortisol at that time. It'll help you feel more energized and alert as you get your day going. And when you want to get more sleep, because I am a big fan of more sleep, you do that by going to bed earlier, wind yourself down, have, you know, do, do your bedtime routine and, and get yourself to bed as early as you can. Even if in that, even if you can only do once or twice a week, um, it's worth doing. So you get that extra sleep. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And then with your acronym hides there. So number five being stress. And we've been talking about that throughout our, our chat here. Anything else you'd like to say on on stress and the impact for um, endo and our hormones? Yeah, I I I like I think the ways we've touched on it along the way, knowing knowing that stress stress itself is not always the enemy. Um, we you know stress can be good too. It, it excites you and motivates you and keeps you focused on something you're doing or working towards or anything like that. So it's it's so much a matter of stress management as opposed to stress avoidance. And so kind of like the detox thing, you want to help yourself to limit the exposure so you're not putting yourself through unnecessary stresses. But when you do have stress going on, that you're, you've are you built your um, resiliency to be able to handle that better. So I think it's important to separate that a little. There can be good stress too. Mm -hmm. um, you just want to be paying attention to that and noticing like, where's the stress coming from? Is this something that I, that I want to be doing and I'm in choice about it? And if so, how can I be on a regular basis releasing stress or recentering myself? Um, some people need the, that release of like a more vigorous, like doing a kickboxing class or going for a you know, hard run or doing something like more intense. Whereas some people feel that like what works better for them is that recentering um, and having a practice of coming back to your breath or doing meditation or some gentle yoga or um, Tai Chi or different kinds of practices that bring you um, into a calmer state. So having you know, figuring out what works for you and having that be part of your regular routine to take care of yourself is important. Yeah. And then the, the chronic stress versus the, the, the mental emotional stress. And then we've been talking here sort of about the biochemical stress, which is different types of stressors. But yeah, as far as digging into I think awareness is key. I, I know when I was diagnosed with premature ovarian failure and, you know, I had both my kids with donor eggs, 
And literally, I actually look back, like at the time, I didn't even think I was stressed, which is absolutely ridiculous because of course I was. Um, I was like, I will move forward and I will keep going and nothing can stop me. And and then, yeah, then my health took a nosedive and it, you know, my body said no more. So it is try to, to, to cultivate that, well, not try, you know, endeavor to cultivate self-awareness to kind of see where, you know, you're irritable, where are things out of alignment and maybe pushing yourself too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think of the application of Marie Kondo a little bit of like, is this activity bringing you joy? Are you, (laughs) are you in your happy place? Is this something that you're really loving doing? Or is it like one of those things that you're kind of, you know, hand to forehead, like, Oh, I wish I didn't have to do this or what's going like, Oh, this, you know, if you're doing things that you dread or whatever, like, yeah, looking at how, how that's influencing you and figuring out, does it really need done or could I get someone else to do it? Maybe it's their happy place no. and they could do it and I, I could be freed up to do something else. Yeah. Looking, looking at all of that is good. And what about, so typically with, with endo, it's perhaps linked to estrogen dominance. What, what's your take on that? So generally speaking, endometriosis is considered an estrogen dominant disease. Um, we know that estrogen drives the uh, replication and growth of cells in general, and certainly is true for endometriosis cells. Um, we also know that the implants, when they're growing in the pelvis, they actually produce their own estrogen, um, which helps to create the environment with that, that feeds the, the cells and lets them grow. So there's, there's definitely a role there. The estrogen dominance, though, has a lot to do with the balance between estrogen and progesterone. So some women with endo actually aren't necessarily estrogen dominant if they're also producing a lot of progesterone. That's a nuanced detail, um, but by and large, women with endo do tend to run either high estrogens or they have poor estrogen detox. So their downstream metabolites of their estrogens run high. Um, I almost always see that, but not always. There are cases that that are you know un, that don't follow the rule book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And anything else like to say about balancing hormones? Um, that the, the role of progesterone can be very important, um, and that uh, there some of the um, studies on the influence of dioxin on the cellular growth uh, of endometriosis, progesterone can help to block that. Mm. Um, and fish oils actually is another thing that, that has been looked at to block some of that influence. Um, so look, looking at one of my favorite in the, we're working with patients and able to prescribe hormones. And this is something that listeners could talk to their doctors about is the idea of using progesterone, um, probably comes up in your conversations for fertility support anyway, to some extent. Um, but when you're using progesterone to help with endometriosis, I really recommend trying to get a suppository form and use a progesterone vaginal insert that can help to bring more progesterone into the the circulation locally. Um, That can be a helpful local version of balancing the hormones and that influence that could be happening from excess estrogens. Hmm. Support for pain management. Any strategies or tips you can recommend there? Yeah, that's the, that's the golden ticket right there. (laughs) There are, I I wish I had like the slam dunk easy answer. Different things are helpful for different people to different degrees. Um, I think that looking at recognizing that pain is one of the um, primary symptoms of endometriosis. Some women have endo and and don't have pain. Um, So that's interesting to know and that that's possible. Um, But for women who do have pain, addressing all five of the hides aspects can very much so help pain. So that's definitely part of the goal. We, we want to see the lesions decrease or have periods be, be better um, and have the pain decrease is definitely um, something that we expect to see when, when a holistic healing is taking place. Um, in the moment for pain and actually something that can be helpful in the healing process too, one of the practices that I love recommending is a castor oil pack. Yeah, they're great. Familiar with those? Mm-hmm. Yep. Do you talk about them on the podcast already or should I Yeah, explain? Yeah, I do have an uh, episode. So I have uh, Dr. Marisol um, nice. Tincarno. Yeah, she has a really awesome one that we like, but yeah, definitely give us an overview for sure. Yeah, hers is fantastic. I, that's That's great that you have that resource available for people. So 
So you can take a um, castor oil. It's a thick, sticky oil. So you want to be, you know, you don't want to be wearing your, you know, fanciest pajamas or something that you don't want to get a little, you know, potentially a little bit messed up. But you rub the oil on your belly. It's a really nice opportunity for either self massage or just gentle self self touch, just healing touch. Um, sometimes we can be so. Because they're just kind of afraid to touch our our bodies, or just so tender that it's it's hard to really stay connected to our belly and our pelvis. So it's a really nice opportunity to like put your hands on your belly, take some healing breaths, you know, appreciate that your body is actually really trying its best with the challenging situation that it's in, and you know, maybe even making a little um, commitment to yourself and to your body to to work in partnership with your body to help you know try to create healing. I think it's a really nice opportunity to tune into your body like that. Um, and you're getting the therapeutic benefit from the castor oil applied topically. And then you cover that with a, a cloth and then put a heat source on top of that, either a hot water bottle or if you use a heating pad, um, you can do that. The old style of castor oil packs would have you cover with a, a sheet of plastic wrap. And I do not recommend doing that piece now that we know more about the, the influences of plastics. So just the oil, a cloth that you're willing to dedicate to the cause, and then heat on top of that. Um, and rest with that for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. You can put a little eye pillow, take a nap, um, or, you know, or whatever, uh, please, you know, you prefer to do. And um, doing that regularly, it helps to decrease inflammation. It helps to support detox, stimulates the, the flow of bile and liver um, action. Also, it can help with digestive health. That's why Marisol talks about it so much. Um, so it's a really, really lovely practice that can be very soothing and helpful. And I, the, the weight of the hot water bottle even just feels nice when you're, when you're in discomfort too. So. Yeah. I, I love doing that practice, and especially in the winter with the hot water bottle. I don't do the hot water bottle as much in the summer, but in the winter, yeah. it just feels like, a, it just feels like a little treat. It's part of the little bedtime ritual where you, you know, oh, you, 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 you slow down and do that. So yeah. yeah. And even if you have a hard time fitting it in. So again, just recognizing stress and busy lives and all of that, you can put it on as you're going to sleep at night yeah. and just, you know, just knock it off in the middle of the night if you wake up and notice it's still there. So it doesn't have to take extra time in your day. But if you can use the opportunity to put a little bit of time and energy into just knowing that this is part of your healing process, um, that's a nice thing to do. So topical um, essential oils can be really helpful. And that's something that people don't always necessarily think about. And uh, uh, CBD actually okay, is yeah. another thing that I've seen make a difference in helping people either taking it orally or applying topically, or there are even vaginal suppositories too. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And any of the essential oils, which ones do you recommend? You know, I'm not an essential oil expert. I don't, I don't know the specifics. I, I have heard patients have good use with them. Or if I pick them up, I'm like just looking for like the blend that says that it's for cramps or something. So sorry, I don't actually know the exact ones. No worries. Okay. And so do you have a, uh, is there a, a book or a website or an app, anything that you're personally obsessed with right now that you'd like to share with the listeners? Let's see. So there, I mean, there's right now, and then there's some, some oldie, but, but goodies also. Yeah. So uh, I was saying you had asked me this ahead of time and I was thinking of an app. I don't, I don't actually um, no, I think there are some apps about tracking um, symptoms around endo specifically, but I just haven't seen any yet that, that maybe they exist. I haven't seen them, but just that like really capture it. But I do really recommend at least a period tracking app. And just to be able to be recording your cycle length and the, the days of the cycle where different symptoms are happening for you, it's really empowering and, and helpful for you as the person living in your body to be tuned in to noticing the rhythms and patterns of when different things tend to happen. And it can be really helpful if you do work with a healthcare provider for them to look at that or for you to be able, able to tell them like, you know, I always get a headache on day 10 or, you know, my, my 
breast tenderness kicks in on day 20 or whatever, like however your routines are, or is you're getting, I'm in my mid forties now. So like, as things are changing, Mm -hmm. it's, it's good to have that recording of like, Oh, my cycles used to be this and now they're doing this and that. So just that idea of tracking and being tuned into your body, I think is really great to do. And an app can be an easy way to do that. In terms of books, there's, there's um, the Endometriosis Association who is the founder is Mary Lou Ballweg. It's Mm B-A-L-L-W-E-G. She has put out several good books. The most recent one is called Endometriosis, The Complete Reference for Taking Charge of Your Health. Um, And I happen to know that she's working on a fourth book. And so whenever that does come out, that would probably be a really good resource for people. Um, People, for listeners who are really interested in the diet and nutrition piece, um, there's a a book that's actually been around for a long time. It's kind of science-y, but you, so if you love that, that's good. Or if you kind of, you know, blank out to some of the details, but get the, the main points that she's saying, there's a book called Endometriosis, A Key to Healing Through Nutrition. That's by Diane Mills, M-I-L-L-S. And that's a really great resource as well. Um, I have a a couple more to mention. Um, One for people who want to learn more about surgery and understanding different approaches and and just understanding surgery better. There's a couple different surgeons have put books out that that I've looked at. Um, One is the uh, Dr. Andrew Cook, and the book is called Stop Endo and Pelvic Pain. Um, and they, they put out a companion, um, like health and diet book too. So you could check that out. Um, and then just, I think it was just a year ago or so, a new book came out called Beating Endo. That's by a surgeon um, named Iris Orbach. And it's co-written with a pelvic physical therapist. Oh, nice. So I think that's something we haven't touched on here, but it really can be an important um, part of the, the whole healing team is a pelvic physical therapist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had, didn't, we did an episode with the pelvic th- physical therapist, so they can be okay. refer back to that. So yeah. 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 And is there a uh, success story you wanted to share with us? Oh, uh, well, my favorite success story to share is my own. So <laughs> that's it works. I had shared earlier of how, how just debilitating and challenging um, endo was for me um, initially. And I actually also did have a second round um, with it. So I, I, my first surgery and diagnosis was in 2001 um, while I was in school. And then, you know, I, I learned a lot from that. I was taking care of myself, but then I was like practicing and I was a new mom and I had, you know, really busy life and lots going on. So I definitely see that stress connection. Um, and pain was getting worse and it was, it, it got ahead of me. I wasn't watching and listening to the signals as, as much as I, I now recommend patients. If you're starting to notice anything like go get an ultrasound so you're getting checked for any cysts growing and, and really step it up. If there's anything that's been slipping a little bit with your diet or your self care or your sleep or anything, like you really want to, want to take action as, as early as possible if you're starting to notice problems. Um, but I, I didn't. So I learned that the hard way. Um, and my endo got really bad again. Um, in 2012, I did have a second surgery. Um, at first I was kind of bummed about that because I wanted to just have like, you know, figured it out, but I do feel really successful in terms of having stage four endo and having only had two surgeries where it could have easily been, you know, 10 or more surgeries right. over this time frame that I've, I've seen from a lot of other patients. So, um, so I think everything else that I've done around, and then I, double down on my education of myself and of my commitment to my own personal health after that surgery. And that surgery was done by an endo specialist. So I think it was a more thorough taking out of the lesions that were there. And I did a more thorough job of, of, you know, uh, addressing all the other issues that can hide and have, have kept up on, on that more or less. So I did actually have a few years ago, another time I I started to have some pain and had a uh, ultrasound that did show like a three and a half centimeter cyst 
um, an endometrioma growing again, but I, I stepped it up with everything that I know to do. And now that cyst is completely gone. Wow. Um, so that's without surgery. I was able to, to clear that endometrioma, no problem. And now, even though my cycle's a little unpredictable with perimenopause, mm-hmm. um, when I do have my periods, I, I have almost no pain at all. I, you know, I still, nurture myself and rest and take good care of myself, but I'm not at all like in pain and wiped out. Like I had been for years and years and years. So I, I'm delighted to, to share that, you know, endometriomas can shrink and go away. And it is possible to have pain-free periods, even if you've, you know, had years of very, very difficult cycles. So mm-hmm. amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Just one follow-up question with uh, the ultrasound, how, how would, how often would you say that you should check in? Is it just kind of like, Oh, wait a minute, I've got some pain. Maybe I should go check in with it. Cause you don't want to do too many ultrasounds obviously, but what do you, would you have a rule of thumb there? Yeah. I, so ultrasounds are, are very, um, like low risk. You know, it's not like getting a CT scan where you have lots of radiation and you don't want to do too many or anything. Like I think if you're concerned, go, go in and ask for an ultrasound. Um, but even if you're just trying to kind of keep tabs on things, you're doing fairly well. I, I recommend doing an annual ultrasound if you've had bad endometriosis that you need to keep, keep an eye on. Um, about so once a year, but if you're actively, if you're like having a cyst and you're working on it and you're, you know, trying to monitor, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Am I, you know, do I need to take additional steps or not? Um, it might be three months or six months that you repeat. Um, but once you're to, into a pretty stable place, I still recommend, um, getting one about once a year. And so just to, and just to go over quickly, um, so when you did have that um, endometrioma there that you found, is there anything you could obviously probably with that acronym hide some of the things that you've done there, but anything, any other strategies you'd want to kind of recommend that you did? To- yeah, so I, I finally got, <laughs> got my butt kicked with that into doing the GI healing that I had uh, just not wanted yeah. to deal with. So I, I wrapped my head around and really committed to taking HCL and enzyme capsules with every single meal three times a day yeah. and really taking all the probiotics and taking the extra gut healing nutrients. And so my, my pile of supplements got bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and I just super duper committed to my my food too. It's like it's just not worth it to no. have that whatever you know on the weekend. So I I got really really the GI piece was something that I had not tackled as fully as I knew I could, but I was kind of hoping that I wouldn't have to. <laughs> uh, but then I really had to. And for the hormone balance, I was. Um, helping my, my, I was, there's a supplement called DIM, D-I-M, which is like concentration from the um, cruciferous family of vegetables. So I was doing that to help with the estrogen progesterone balance, but I wasn't actually taking progesterone. Um, and I, I began using the vaginal progesterone inserts around the time that I was also doing the, the really more intensive GI healing and a, a, a recommitment to my stress management. Um, those were the pieces that I, that I, that had been wavering or not quite fully dialed in until that last round a couple of years ago. I was like, okay, I gotta do this. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. That's all part of our method too, where we, we look at, we use the GI map and look at stool testing, address those gut infections and the food sensitivities and dig in deeper. So that, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah. okay. And so you have a free download here for the listeners and it's called, um, why am I so tired? And they can get that at replenish your energy.com forward slash quiz. And we'll have that link in the show notes and what can they expect with that download or that quiz? Yeah. So yeah, it's a quiz and it'll, it'll walk through helping you look at different aspects of why you're so tired. And as you've heard, you know, through, throughout this call, I really have come to believe because I've seen it, you know, thousands of times Mm -hmm. that stress is such a huge factor and helping your body be more resilient, uh, is, is absolutely the, the path of healing um, I, you know, we can't prevent ourselves from being exposed to everything, but we can really boost our energy and boost our vitality and boost our ability to be resilient to things. So you'll get a resiliency score um, as, after you take the quiz and then some tips and recommendations on um, things that you can do to start helping to build your resiliency. So 
it's it the connection between stress and hormones um, is very very clear and the connection between your hormone balance and stress on endometriosis it's it's just something i see all the time and even though this quiz is applicable to women without endometriosis because i have endo is definitely part of my whole thinking in in creating this quiz and um, we we have a, a whole eight week program that helps women um, build their resiliency and replenish their energy and support their adrenal health um, as part of of that process. So it's it's something that is really foundational and important for women with endo um, and for any kind of hormone imbalance issues. Excellent. So definitely check that out at replenishyourenergy.com forward slash quiz. We'll have that in the show notes. Any final thoughts on this subject, Dr. Amy? I would just say that uh, I really encourage women to keep seeking help or, you know, if you're dealing with endometriosis, uh, just that, that you um, educate yourself and keep looking for answers. I think it's one of those conditions that you can run into a, a wall really easily um, unfortunately, in our society, women's health has just not been prioritized for research, but it is getting a little bit better. Um, and there are options and there are people who can help. Um, so if you're feeling like your doctor's dismissive or they're funneling you into surgery is like the only option or putting even putting it out there of like, well, surgery is going to be the answer. And that, you know, that's all you have to do. Um, and just really encourage you to to tune into your body and what feels right to you and um, and take the holistic approach so that you help yourself to find the answers you need and that it is absolutely possible to feel better. And I, I hope that you find your way. Amazing. Thanks for sharing your personal journey with this and your words of wisdom. And thank you for coming on and uh, sharing with us today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. This was a really fun conversation. Thank you. And thank you so much for the doing this podcast and for supporting all the people that you do. Um, it's really wonderful work. So thank you. Awesome. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have four spots available per month to work with us. I would like to invite you and your partner to a supercharge your fertility discovery call. And this calls for you if you meet at least one of these criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This calls for action takers. If you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. If you're seriously considering working with us, Go to Fab Fertile, F A B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. That's Fab Fertile, F A B Fertile, and click on Book a Free Call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. You may be taking supplements that, instead of optimizing your fertility, may be harming it. That's why we recommend professional grade supplements without harmful dyes, fillers, or top allergens. Simply go to Fab Fertile Store, that's F A B Fertile Store dot com to receive a 15% discount on our basic supplement recommendations for preconception health. That's fabfertilestore.com. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.